here we go as we start the first of our livestock units being the beef industry as we go through make sure to take notes and put any questions you have down this will take you about a week to finish up on these notes as there is a lot to cover so as we start into the beef industry First question um, a lot of people always ask is why do we raise beef? You can say it's because of the steaks, it's because of their cuteness and their cuttiness, their fluffiness. But overall the reason we raise beef is because of the beta 14 link cellulose. While this is very scientific terms, what this actually means is they are able to convert acreages of feedstuff, grass and corn and all that that is unusable to humans into actual meat product, therefore being beef. There are a lot of feed items like corn and grass that we cannot digest and actually use in our body. So luckily we have this animal that can do that for us. You probably hear me say or will hear me say several times that I am a secondhand vegetarian, the cow eats the grass, I eat the cow. This is because of that beta 14 linked cellulose. So, beef is great. With this, Kansas is also ranked number two in feed yards. The amount of cattle put into the market, the number of processed cattle in the state, meat production from beef cattle, and also the number of cattle. So we are, while we say we are the wheat state, we are also a very high beef production state. As you already did the terms for livestock industry, we are still going to touch on those again. A bull is an intact male. A steer is a castrated male. One that we did not go over is a bullock. This would be a young bull that is destined for slaughter. Um, so therefore, they don't get it reproduced very long. Um, they're also not castrated. A cow is a mature female. A heifer is a young female prior to their first calving. Prior to first calving, you usually hear it called a calf as a young animal in the cattle industry. Um, you can also hear it as a bull or a heifer at that age before they can reproduce. So while we talk about the beef industry, there is a lot that we have to talk about as in the structure of the actual industry. So as we go through this, I'm going to go from left to right and explain it. And then the next couple slides are going to go into a little bit more depth on these areas. So we first start with the seed stock producer to commercial cow calf. From there, it can go two ways. It goes to stocker or it goes to feedlot, which we'll talk about in the next couple slides. From there, it goes to a processing plant or slaughterhouse. From there, it can go to three different areas, restaurant, export, or retail. So as we go through the beef industry structure, a lot of these steps aren't completed by one producer for that single animal. You will probably see an animal transfer between each of these steps at a certain time. Because of this reason, we are going to go through each and every step along the way. For your notes, I want you to fill out the same table that will go into your notebook. Make sure to write down specifics about each step that is pointed out in this PowerPoint. So our first step is the seed stock producer. In this step, they as in the producer, have what we call the seed, or in this case, the embryos and the semen of the beef. This can include purebred or registered bulls, cows, heifers, semen, embryos, and these add value to the beef cattle genetics. A lot of our producers in the larger part of the industry do not have their own bulls on site. What they do is called AI, or artificial insemination, and they get the semen from a registered bull company to come in. An example of this in Kansas would be Gen X. 
they supply semen to cattle producers that way when it's ready to breed all they have to do is give them a small stick that has 10 milliliters of semen in it instead of bringing out a 2,000 pound bull. The next three parts of this process, commercial cow calf, stalker, and feedlot, are gone into a lot more detail on the next few slides. I'm going to touch base on it here and then we're going to pick on it, pick up on it next couple slides. So the first one is commercial cow calf. Once that cow is bred, they are placed in a cow calf operation. This operation is the method of raising beef in which a permanent herd of cows is kept by a farmer or rancher to produce calves for later sale. So this will typically look a lot like the farmers we have around us. You'll just see a bunch of cows out there and maybe a bull or two to clean up what the artificial insemination might not have caught to make that cow pregnant. Called cow calf because as soon as that cow has their calf, that calf stays in that operation until a certain size. From there, it can go one of two places, stalker or feedlot. A stalker unit, so like livestock in that sense, these are calves that are too small or light to enter a feedlot. Okay, these are the calves that are going straight from milk to grass instead of milk to grain like in a feedlot. So these calves that are small and light, they go to a program that utilizes grazing or being in the pasture. If the calves are large enough, these calves go into a feedlot, kind of like the ones right by the school, Mangan feedlot. Okay, this is what we call a finishing beef facility. Okay, they are sent there about four to six months old if they're large enough, and then they go to a processing plant after that when they're about 1,100 to 1,300 pounds. From there, when they're the size, they go to that processing plant or slaughterhouse. This can look different for different size of operations. Um, smaller operations can go to a little bit closer feedlot, but a lot of the ones that we see is we load up these cattle on the cattle trucks and they can go to Garden City, down to Dodge, even down to Oklahoma, wherever there's a big processing plant that can process about 100 to 200 cattle a day. From there, depending on the cattle and their use, they can go three places, restaurant, export, and retail. Restaurant, obviously, if it's a processing plant like Tyson, that's going to go straight into a retail, not a restaurant. Okay, Heritage would be an example of restaurant. They're going to process it, and a restaurant can buy the meat to go straight into the store. Export is going to be a lot of your larger plants that are exporting, say, ground beef or um, canned or processed meats to other countries or other states. Last one is retail. Um, this is basically any company that can get it with a middleman. Um, so, for instance, a store would be a middleman in retail. Um, Heritage's front of their building is retail. Those are going to be retail to get that product to the consumer. So there's three different ways, restaurant, export, and retail. So as I said before, the next three slides are going to cover cow, calf, stalker, and feedlot management of beef industry. So this first one is cow, calf management. When we're talking about cow, calf, Okay, they have been bred, we're holding on to them, so we have to make sure that we are managing them correctly so we can make a profit in the end. In most beef industries with cow-calf operations, they're going to calve in the spring of the year. That's why a lot of our farmers are really busy between January to March to even April because that's when they're calving. During this time, those farmers are so busy because we have dyscocia. This is number one concern for first calf heifers, and they have to be supervised. What dyscocia means is that calf might be too large for that cow to give birth easy. Um, typically, this is what we look into if a cow um, is going to have to have a C-section. Um, 
and it is a really big thing with heifers because some of them might not be fully developed or large enough to have that calf. If we are not supervising this, both the heifer and the calf can die. So this is a really big thing for farmers, especially with first time heifers that we have to watch for. When those calves are born, they're typically weighing about 70 to 90 pounds. Um, they can be higher and lower depending on genetics, which is something we'll talk about when we get into the genetics section of animal science. Okay, with these cow-calf management, we also have to look at those heifers and those cows after they have their babies. Okay, a thin female is difficult to bring back. When we talk about cattle or just management of animals, um, mammals, anything in general, it is really hard to breed an animal back if they are not able to maintain their own body weight or keep themselves healthy. So these thin females, they are very hard to breed back because they're trying to actually get some extra fat or extra meat on their own bones, therefore they're not going to worry about a fetus. With cow-calf management, a majority of these cows are pasture or pen mated, so that means we can throw a bull in with them. A lot of our operations nowadays, if we are looking for better genetics, we're going to use this AI or artificial insemination or estrus synchronization method. Um, artificial insemination is typically used um, in a lot of operations if you're trying to get better genetics. And what estrus synchronization is, again, we'll talk about it in reproduction. But what estrus synchronization is, is we're going to get make, we're going to make sure all of our cattle, um, cows and heifers are on the same cycle, so they can all be bred at the same day, instead of trying to go out and breed them one day, maybe two or three here and there. That way they're all about the same date of calving instead of spread out over three months. Because we're trying to use better genetics and we can look to use this AI or estrus synchronization, we can also do a lot of crossbreeding to improve those low heritable traits. So when I'm talking about low heritable traits, one of the things um, for a common breed that we have out here in western Kansas would be Angus. One of their low heritable traits that we do not like are their maternal instincts, so being an actual good mother. One of the high heritable traits that we like about Angus is their carcass and their marbling of the meat. Therefore, we're going to use Angus more to crossbreed with a better maternal cattle breed like Herefords. That way we can have a good mother but also have a great marbling in that meat that we're going to take from that calf that we're going to raise to go to the feedlot and into the processing plant. In this cow-calf management, we are selling those calves off the cows or retaining them throughout the feedlot phase. So you will see this both of these ways potentially in a beef production area. In this phase also you will see ranchers picking out some good heifers that are born to replace some of those older cows that may have stopped producing or should have had their last calf. Because this is where it all begins with a cow and calf it takes up a lot of land requirement. It takes also a lot of producers. In the U.S., there are 800,000 producers of cow-calf pairs, which is quite a bit even though this industry is so large. So now we're moving on to where this calf that is 70 to 90 pounds is going to go from there. Okay, Up until this point, that calf has been on the mother drinking milk, um, learning from their mom to eat the grass in the pasture but from there we're at the weaning stage and we have to figure out where they're going to go so they're either going to go to the stalker unit or they're going to go to the feedlot okay again if they're small we're going to start at the stalker unit which is our next point in our stalker unit we usually call this our yearling production so we're taking these calves that have been on the moms and we're either going to take them to, again, 
the pasture or they're going to go into the feedlot. Our smaller yearlings, so about 600 or under, these calves are going to go into a stalker unit. Okay. These calves are weaned from the cow herd and put into a different pasture for cheap gains. Okay. Wheat pastures, um, native grasslands, those are cheaper, low-cost roughages than it is to put them straight onto corn or wheat grains. So we're going to utilize this low-cost roughages, pastures. Um, we can actually add some hay into there also, but we're going to use that to help get these calves to the size to start putting them on grain. We can increase gains though by creating a better grassland. Typically we don't see this out in western Kansas because we have a lot of burn bans, but if you go to eastern Kansas you'll hear of burning the prairie um, in late spring. This is to help create better grasses. It's burning off the dead ones and helping rejuvenate that soil and those roots to help grow a thicker and better grassland. When you are putting calves on this stalker unit in the grass and pasture, there are some very health conscious things that you have to do though. Okay, there can be toxic weeds for cattle. Um, one common one is called woolly loco weed. Loco meaning what? Crazy. So this weed can actually make a cow go crazy. So you want to reduce that weed so you actually need to check the pasture and it's called range management. That way your cows aren't eating plants that can be toxic to them. The other big thing that has come out of this is our grass-fed beef for consumers. This has become a major trend in the beef industry um, and restaurant industry of people wanting grass-fed beef. Therefore, these steaks that are produced can only be from cattle that eat only grass. Okay, there are ups and downs to this process. I'm more on the side of don't do grass-fed, but there are people that want. Reason I um, can show you both sides of this is one, okay, grass-fed is gonna take longer to get to weight. If you look at it this way, how much do you have to eat a salad versus eating a hamburger to gain a certain pound? It's the same way for cattle. The grass is going to be our salad, and for them, eating a hamburger, which is ironic, is going to be the same for them eating grain. Okay, it's going to be easier to get to weight eating that more protein than it is just that salad to fill them up. So those grass-fed beef are going to be actually out on pasture longer, therefore taking them longer to get to market, and also making that time that you get a profit a longer time to wait. While they're also in this pasture, um, you have to utilize vaccinations and implant programs. Um, they still can get diseases from being out on grass instead of in a pasture. Plus, you always want to give them um, these vaccines that help them survive. Um, just like we usually get the flu shot or tetanus shot, they have the same thing for cattle. We talk about implant programs. These are more um, hormones to help them grow at a certain time because again you can't get all the same nutrients you can from a salad that you can a hamburger same for cattle you can't get the same from grass that you can from a grain diet the way this implant looks um, it's just a little pill basically that they put into the ear so it slowly is absorbed through the blood those hormones help them build testosterone or uh, other hormones that they need to grow that muscle. This muscle is again helping them produce protein in the body, therefore we're helping prepare those cattle and their diets to enter a feedlot. Once they're ready for the feedlot, then we're going to put them in the feedlot. So now we're to the feedlot of the beef industry. Again, if that calf is over 600 and is about 700 pounds, we're going to put them straight into a feedlot. If they're a little bit smaller, we're going to put them into that stalker unit. Once they've hit that 700 pound mark, we can put them into this feedlot to finish them out 
for market. Um, again, if they're grass fed, we can't put them in here. They're going to stay in the pasture. So in the feedlot, um, you've seen these as you can see in these pictures here. Feedlot is enclosed bin. They can have an indoor structure and also an outdoor structure. Um, most of these feedlots are located on the high plains of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. So that's why you, if you're in town, you see all these cattle trucks coming through because we are basically the highway of feedlots. We have quite a bit around us. Um, and in this area, also, we have an abundant feed and slaughter facilities. Okay, a couple years ago, when the Tyson plant in Garden City um, had a big fire going on, we had to be able to reroute 10,000 cattle a day to different slaughtering facilities because that's how much that Garden City plant took of beef in the area daily. In the feedlot, there are two main types. Um, the first one is a farmer feeder. This would be an example of Mangan Feed Yard. Um, they are a feedlot that has less than a thousand head. Um, they feed their own cattle and then they use to supplement other farm expenses. Okay, so Mangan Feed Lot is also Mangan Farms and they have other enterprises that they have going on within their family farm. These ones are actually also farmer owned. Um, you might see them as an LLC or just a family feedlot name on it. The other one is a commercial feedlot. When you see these commercial feedlots, you'll probably see um, either bigger names on them or multiple names or even just a company name. These commercial feedlots usually hold more than a thousand head. Um, they have a feed customer cattle. Um, they have contracts with packers. They probably have contracts with stalker units or cow calf management operations also. Um, and they also use a lot of feed. Example of this in our area would be Oxtown. Um, another one, if you're going to Scott City, would be HRC feed yards as you're pulling in to Scott City um, or the one south of Scott City as you're going to Garden. Those would be your commercial feedlots. With any type of feedlot, they have to be concerned with environmental issues. In your notes, what I want you to do is find a section and just write down on feedlots what you think would be environmental issues. Once you have those down, we're going to talk about them a little bit. So pause this and then come back. So when you're talking about environmental issues in a feedlot, there are a few things that can happen. Okay, One would be the air quality. Okay, They already are trying to say cattle is the reason we have a lot of greenhouse gases. And when you see a feed yard like the bottom right picture, yeah, that can be a concern because th those cows aren't just in there. They're going to have gas. They're going to breathe out. There is a lot of air pollution being released, but it's not as much as ca as cars. Um, but that is going to be an issue that they have to deal with, and they have to be approved by the EPA with these feedlots. Okay. Another environmental issue is going to be the amount of sewage that these feedlots put off. In every feedlot production area, one of these pens, like you can see in the top picture on the right, one of those pens will hold a herd of cattle that will go in at the same time and out at the same time. Once they leave, we have to clean that pen. So we're going to take a skid steer and run through there and clean it all up. That way we don't get diseases that can go into the next herd coming in. Okay, so all that sludge and all that sewage has to go somewhere. This is why you typically smell feedlots when you're going past them or dairies. It's because it's going to, into those lagoons. So they have that excess water and that manure going into those lagoons. This can create a major environmental issue because what's going to happen if there's certain... Um, chemicals or something in it as they're cleaning it that get into the ground. Okay, that sewage we have to put in that lagoon that way we can filter it and get that out. If you don't have one of those lagoons you can get in some major issues. There are some feedlots that do not have to have lagoons. Um, this is 
because of certain Kansas laws. If you would like to look into that, I have included the link below. That way you can look into why certain feedlots don't have lagoons. Um, it does come down to the amount of head of cattle in the feedlot and also how active those are. From this feedlot, okay, once they're up to that weight of 1,100 to 1,300, um, some feedlots even go higher, these are going to go into that processing plant. Again, go into that processing plant, then it can go to one of those three areas, export, retail, or restaurant. Before we move on, make sure you complete that beef industry structure chart, turn that into your notes, and then you can start on the next section. As we talked about in the structure of the beef industry, the very first thing we talk about is the genetics, We're talking about that seed stock unit. Okay, as we talk about genetics, we found that there are six main traits that are important to these beef cattle. The first one we're going to talk about is reproductive performance. When we talk about reproductive performance, the first thing we want to talk about is the percent of the calf crop. We want 100% of our calf crop each year. Okay, what this means is if I had a herd of 50 head of cow, I want 50 calves born. Okay. It is common for all cows to have one baby with the chance of having twins or more, but they should at least have one. Along with this, we want to make sure they have one calf every 365 days or every year. This is possible because they have a postpartum interval of 90 days or less, and they are pregnant for an average of 283 days. Therefore, every 365 days, they can have a calf. Reproductive performance is lowly heritable. Therefore, it isn't passed along in genetics. Um, yes, it is common to have one calf per year, and a cow that has twins is not a heritable trait that gets passed along the way. The last thing when we're looking at reproductive performance is we want to look at lower birth weights. As we talked about before, those first-year heifers sometimes have problems having calves. If they have a big calf, they're going to have difficulty birthing. Therefore, we are trying to select for lower birth weights to help save those younger cows and heifers. The next trait we look at is weaning weight. Weaning weight reflects the milk production of cow. If she has high production and a high cream count in her milk, that calf is more likely to grow faster than in one that is not. We typically wean calves at seven months of age. So depending on how the seven months of milk production goes, that calf is going to be larger or smaller. During those seven months also, we have to look at what feed resources are available for calves. This is why we change when we birth calves. If we were to calve in the fall, the seven months going on would be winter. Therefore, no fresh grass. Um, if they do it in the spring, they're more likely to get fresh grass in a full pasture, depending on weather. With those calves being born in the spring, we typically wean them in the fall. These fall calves are more likely to go into a feedlot if they're at weight, or again, if they are needed to go to a stalker unit, we're going to supplement them with hay because fall brings winter, therefore bringing snow and no grass. Our third trait is post weaning growth. So when we take them off the cow, there's some things we're trying to get out of that calf. As soon as that calf is weaned off the cow, they go through a period of weight loss. Okay, The stress of moving from pasture, the stress of going away from their mother, is going to impact what they're gaining. 
This usually lasts only about a week to two weeks, but it could last longer depending on the amount of stress. Luckily, after weaning, they have about 10 months to get to the right weight. So growth from weaning to finish weight goes from 7 months to 17 months. From there, they can go to two places again. They can go to grass, which is the stalker unit, or they can go straight to grain, which is the feedlot. The growth of a calf to this point is now affected mostly by nutrients. The better the quality of nutrients and the better quantity of nutrients like calcium and protein are going to help those calves get to weight faster. Along with those nutrients, we can also use implants. These implants are hard pellets placed under the skin of the ear to replace hormonal effects removed from castration. Okay, most of the time when we're talking about stalker and feedlots, we are talking about steers. We're going to save the heifers for reproduction while we use steers because they can't reproduce to go into a feedlot or stalker unit. Our fourth trait is feed efficiency. With this trait, we are looking to see how much feed it is going to take for a calf to gain a pound. So we're going to look at this as pound of feed required per pound of gain. This ratio can change depending on the diet. Out of all of our livestock breeds, beef cattle has the highest. This goes from a 5 to 1 to an 8 to 1 ratio. That again meaning it takes 5 pounds of feed to make 1 pound of meat on that animal. Or 8 pounds of feed to 1 pound. The closer we can get that ratio 1 to 1 is better for the farmer because it's going to be cheaper for them when it comes to buying the actual grains. One of the issues we do have is if it's a more concentrated diet, so therefore meaning just grain, it's going to be more difficult to gain weight. A concentrated diet or just grain diet makes the digestibility of those proteins go down, therefore making that feed to gain ratio go up. This means we have to have a good mix of concentrated and roughage diet for the beef we are feeding. Think of it in this term. How easy is it for you to digest corn versus you digesting a tablespoon of sugar or honey? Hopefully you said it's easier for you to digest the straight sugar. This is because that corn has complex sugars that your body has to break down. Therefore, it's going to take a lot more energy for your body to use it. The same thing is with cows. It's a lot harder for them to break down that corn and any other products in grain than it would be for them just to break down that grass. Again, this is because cattle are awesome and they can break down that beta-14 linked cellulose. Our next trait is carcass merit. The main goal of beef cattle is to get that product off of the beef, therefore meaning the meat, the steak, the ground beef. That's what we want off. So this carcass merit is based on a couple things, quality grade and yield grade. The first one is quality grade. When we're talking about quality grade, we're talking about palatability. How easy is it to eat? Three highest grades that we're going to look into in order are prime, choice, and select. The chart to the right is showing how we make a quality grade. It's going to be based on the degree of marbling in the meat and also the maturity of the animal. So using the chart, if we were to find an animal with a moderate marbling that is from a B maturity steer, therefore meaning it is 30 to 42 months or about three years old, 
this would give us a quality grade of a choice steak. The further to the bottom right we go, the older and the tougher a meat is. Okay, we typically see this with like really old cows that can't reproduce anymore and are just turned into hamburger. Therefore, it's just cutter meat or it's meat that we just give to um, pet food places to put into dog food. The more we go up to the top left is going to be our younger calves with a lot of marbling. Okay, it's a lot more tender. Therefore, that's what we're going to be looking for in a steak. Yield grade is the next part of carcass merit. This is determining cutability, or how much meat we can actually get off that animal. This is based on four traits. The heart, hot carcass weight, fat thickness at the 12th rib, percent of kidney, heart, and pelvic fat, and the ribeye area. This is done on a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 being the highest. Yield grade 1 means we have a thin layer of fat over the loin area, over that kidney and heart, but not a lot that's going to take away from that meat. Okay, If you remember, when you eat a juicy steak, there's a part of that fat that you don't eat. You usually call it gristle. Okay, That is what we're looking at for yield grade. We want it that to be as small as possible, but not take away the flavor from that steak. So one would be very little, five would be a lot of that gristle that you can't eat, therefore you're taking away the actual meat and that muscle that you're going to eat from that steak, therefore giving you a five yield. While these two grades are very important, the one that we worry about mostly today is quality driven. Okay, Kind of like we talked about with the overall industry, a lot of the products you eat are based on quality. What is it like and are you going to be satisfied with the product that you are getting? The last important trait of beef cattle is longevity. We want to keep those cows and the cow-calf herd around as long as possible. This longevity is based on the length of the productive life. This usually starts at that two-year mark because when they're two years old, that's when their first calf can be born. We typically want to keep that cow around for about eight to ten years. If she doesn't make it eight years, we're going to get rid of her. If she makes it longer than 10 years, then we're going to see what genetics we can keep from her and her offspring to keep around in our herd. If we are going to cull or get rid of some cows, we talk about the three O's. The first one is old. These are typically cows that have lost or wear out their teeth. Okay, Cows have to rely on their teeth to eat the grass or eat the grain and chew their cud in order to maintain or gain weight. If they don't have that, they will most likely not reproduce. Our second O is open. Open is when we talk about a cow has not conceived or maintained a pregnancy. Okay, They fail reproductively. There is no point in keeping a cow around that is not going to have a calf. If this happens, we need to get rid of that cow and bring in a new heifer into that spot for your cow-calf herd. Our last O is ornery. If you have a cow that is constantly trying to ram you or hurt other cows and presents a bad disposition, get rid of it. There is no medical bill, emergency bill, worth keeping a cow around that is going to cause harm to you, others, or the, your herd. If you are able to look for those three O's in your herd and replace those old cow, old open or ornery cows with better heifers, the better your production of your herd will be, which in the long run is what we want. Great. Now we've talked about management of our cattle herds and also the best traits to keep. Now we're going to talk about breeds. 
as we talk about breeds, I'm going to bring up some terms first, and then I'm going to talk about the overall categories that breeds of cattle fall into, and then you're going to go through those different breeds. This lecture will end after I talk about the three categories of beef cattle, and then you can take notes on all the breeds after that. Once you're done with the breeds, there is an assignment that will be posted on Classroom for you to finish. The first thing we're going to do is provide you with a couple of terms that you may not know, may not know the definition of, to help you understand certain characteristics of these cattle breeds as you go along. The first one is pulled. This means they are born naturally without horns. The second is horned. Okay, They are born naturally with the ability to grow horns, but not all breeds who have this horned genetic ability will grow them. Next is marbling. This is the desirable presence of fat in the muscle. It makes the flavor of the beef. If you remember in a raw steak before you cook it, it's that white on the inside, the intramuscular fat that we like to add flavor to those steaks. Our fourth term is cutability. This is the amount of available retail cuts from a carcass, or the amount of meat that we're actually getting off of that butchered animal. Dual purpose means that they're a dual purpose breed or used for two things, traditionally both milk and beef production. The last term is calving, which is the process of a cow giving birth. There are more than 250 recognized breeds of cattle. We are not going to go through all of those, but I'm going to hit on some of the important breeds of cattle or some of the ones you will mostly see. These cattle are broken up into three categories based on their origin. British Continental, which is considered Europe, or Zebu American, which means it comes from an origin of India. The first one we're going to talk about is British. When we talk about British breeds of cattle, these are usually moderate, mature-sized cattle. They have strong maternal traits and fertility, so they're really good mothers. Majority of cow herds are based on British origin. Makes sense because we want them to become good mothers, therefore growing herds in that sense. British breeds were imported to improve longhorns in Spanish cattle origin. If you have a chance, my suggestion would be to watch the movie Rare Breed. It actually talks about the improvement of the longhorn in America. And the last thing about British breed is the majority of the U.S. cow herds do some crossbreeding with U.S. breeds to use this British maternal instinct and fertility to help grow our genetics and stock in the U.S. Our second category is continental, or the European breeds. The continental breed is used mostly to increase muscle growth and leanness. A majority of imports happened in the early 1960s to the US, US for these breeds. An example of this would be out to the side, your Charlet. Our third category is very different from the other two as a Zebu American and it has very distinct features on it. Okay, Typically we see this as Bos indicus, indicus meaning India, that's where its origin comes from. These cattle are known to be heat tolerant and insect resistant. So we're gonna see these ones more along the equator and in areas where it gets really hot or swampy areas. With that, I'm gonna leave you to the breeds just to write not listen to me lecture, but I did want to let you know each cattle breed that you're going to go through will have a slide on information and then it'll have a picture on the next page. As you go through it, make sure to point out those key characteristics because there are some breeds that look similar. If you have questions, be sure to ask. 
Carlin has taken this class before. If you have any questions on cattle breeds, I'm sure she will be happy to help.